Okay, we're now recording. Welcome everybody to the first ever first annual City Dow Academic Conference. Thank you so much to everybody who has been a part of putting this together, creating it. Thank you so much to everybody who is attending and uh, will be attending. This is going to run all day today. We'll be finishing at, I believe, 4 p.m. EST. And maybe I have that. Yeah, no, that's correct. And then we'll we'll hang out a little bit afterwards. And then we'll begin tomorrow at the same time, 11 a.m. EST, and run all day to 4 p.m. So we have a bunch of different stuff going on today. We start with our keynote speaker. And then after that, we'll discuss what the next panel is. But I would like to invite uh, Professor Dr. Melinda McClemmons to please introduce our keynote speaker. Oh, uh, Melinda, thank you. I will introduce myself briefly. My name is David. Um, I am the facilitator for the Education and Research Guild at CityDAO. Our grand mission is to build CityDAO University, which will be a decentralized liberal art accredited liberal arts school of some kind that hopefully will be decentralized and not in one location, but accredited and whatever that looks like in the future. And as we do that, we run a variety of initiatives and proposals. We have lots of people who do all kinds of things in terms of classes and working on journal articles and books and research. And one of our big initiatives has been to put together this conference, which has been a great pleasure to work with everybody on. And if anybody ever wants to get involved, you can come to CityDAO to the Discord, or you can always email me, david at citydow.io, or email education at citydow.io. Now over to Melinda. Welcome, everyone. So glad to be joining you this morning. It's my great pleasure to introduce Professor David Staley um, and his talk on anarchy in the university. Um, professor David Staley is an associate professor in the Department of History at Ohio State. Um, that's also where I work. Um, uh, but he teaches in several departments. He teaches courses in digital history and digital methods. Um, he, he has taught courses on design history and design futures. And he is, he's also a professor in educational studies at Ohio State, um, where he has led the forum. It's just a forum called Forum on the University. So he, he's the author of Historical Imagination, Alternative Universities, um, Brain, Mind, and the Internet, a deep history and future. So he's all about using history to help imagine the future. So it's um, really exciting to have him here. Thank you so much, Professor Staley, for joining us. I'm gonna leave it over to you now. Thanks very much, uh, Melinda, both for, the, both for that introduction, uh, but also for the invitation to, uh, uh, to open, open the conference. It's, uh, it's a real honor. I was going to allow you to do that, Melinda, or uh, I was going to do it. So, um, I want to first start with my uh, with my initial slide here, and I was uh, pleased that uh, before we started, at least a couple of people got the reference. For those of you. Uh, maybe not old enough or uh, 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 may not remember this. This is uh, a reference to the Sex Pistols' uh, first, uh, first album, Anarchy in the UK. Title of my talk is Anarchy in the University. And I think I want to be, want to be very clear uh, before I start what I mean by anarchy. And I'll be defining anarchy at, at, at various points throughout, throughout my talk. But I think we sometimes assume, and maybe it's because of the Sex Pistols, who knows? We, who knows? We sort of assume that anarchy means sort of chaos and disorder and violence and sort of uh, what the absence of authority, the absence of government. And that's, I suppose, I suppose that's 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 one definition, but uh, it is not the it's not a predominant definition. And it's certainly not one that's in common use today. 
Uh, we've, uh, we've a number of uh, theorists, I'll introduce a couple of them, um, who've been talking about anarchy. And it strikes me that uh, those of us that are interested in DAOs, those of us that are interested in the organizational form that is a DAO, uh, are maybe, without, maybe without realizing it, are uh, anarchists uh, at, uh, at their core. So I think what I wanna do here today is to sort of explore the relationship between anarchy and DAOs, and then to sort of ask the question, what would it mean, as David posits, what would it mean to create a university organized as a DAO? Uh, everyone here has the same uh, sort of definition of a DAO. I just wanna make certain that we're, that we're all, all clear on that, and, and in particular, the sorts of things that, that interest me and draw my attention. The idea that a DAO is a particular kind of organization, one, where it's the members that are controlling it, not by some sort of centralized government or some sort of centralized authority. Um, and that is uh, something that puts the idea of a DAO very much at odds with the contemporary organization of the university. And it's that, it's that dichotomy that I wanna be able to explore here today. But all of this in service of asking the question, what if we organized a university or manage uh, a university like a DAO? What, what would that look like? What would its practice be? I've been very interested in the work of Clyde Barrow, who wrote this very provocative book about, uh, about four years ago, I think this came out. So the, the entrepreneurial intellectual in the corporate university. And in many ways, that is uh, uh, almost a description of Clyde Barrow himself. Uh, he is uh, one of those entrepreneurial intellectuals. What he does in this book is to, first of all, critique the, um, critique the idea of a corporate university, or at least the university as it exists today. Uh, he is drawn, he, Barrow, is drawn to a definition uh, by Henry Steck. The corporate university is an institution that's characterized by processes, decisional criteria, expectations, organizational culture and operating practices that are taken from and have their origins in the modern business corporation. You have a number of people that sort of say, boy, the problem with the universities is they're not run like businesses. Barrow would beg to differ. The argument is that they exactly are. Uh, they look uh, in their form, in their management style, uh, in their management organization, they look very much like corporations. And Barrow pushes back against this. This book is sort of a description of a, of a center that, uh, that he started at, uh, at his previous institution uh, and uh, how he functioned as an entrepreneur. In other words, he didn't, uh, he, he didn't uh, take funding from uh, the college. It was all uh, uh, he, he ran a public policy center. Uh, and uh, so it was all contract work. He uh, uh, drove revenue. Uh, he also ran into challenges uh, with his university when the provost said, yeah, I'm going to take $25,000 from your center and put it over here because I need it to solve this problem. And, and Barrow's like, no, you, don't have, you can't have access to that money. You didn't, uh, you didn't provide that. For Barrow, the university is is a structure that uh, allows him to engage in entrepreneurial activity. But that's not the university in which he was embedded. And I, indeed, I would say uh, the kind of university that most of us uh, that are in university life don't operate in. The corporate university in many ways is the exact opposite of a DAO. This was an article that came out in, uh, in 2017 by, uh, by David Siegel. And where you can see the, uh, the title, how anarchy can, uh, can save the university. And uh, part of what he does in, in, in this article is sort of describe, again, the bureaucratic corporate nature of the contemporary university. He notes that the ranks of non-academic administrative and professional staff, in other words, people who, uh, who aren't uh, uh, teachers, for instance, not professors, more than doubled between 87 and 2012. The at Cornell, he's talking specifically about Cornell, the bureaucracies become so onerous and so inimical to the academic mission that a special committee, of course, a special committee recently assigned to investigate the matter recommended the creation of the position of anti-red tape czar to unwind the damage, which is kind of ironic, isn't it? Create another administrative position 
to deal with too much administration. Well, we'll leave that aside. But as uh, Huxley cautioned, too much organization is a problem. It suffocates the creative spirit. Too much organization. And maybe that's at heart what they're talking about here, uh, that the problem with the contemporary university is that there's too much organization. A DAO, of course, uh, is a much lighter kind of organization. It's part of what fascinates me so much. When, um, <clears throat> when I cite uh, people like Barrow, when I talk uh, about uh, David Siegel, and I talk about others that are evoking anarchy, that are evoking the term anarchy, they are drawing uh, from uh, Pierre-Joseph uh, uh, Proudhon, the French, uh, the French thinker, 19th century French thinker, who had a very specific sort of definition of anarchy. And again, uh, Proudhon's uh, definition of anarchy uh, is not you know, chaos and violence. Uh, but it's a, uh, a decentered sort of organization. Barra says, I turn to the theoretical works of Pierre Joseph Proudhon for a model of decentralized networks of individual proprietorships and producer associations as the basis for a new social category of entrepreneurial intellectuals, right? Uh, and uh, 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 Barra goes on to say, uh, considering Proudhon, leads me to wonder if the university could be reconstructed as a network of decentralized autonomous producer associations. Again, that starts to sound very much like a DAO, doesn't it? And again, a definition uh, or Proudhon's definition of a producer association, um, voluntary contracts negotiated in the mutual interests of the producers entering into these relationships rather than being enforced or mandated by coercive laws and administrative regulations. And again, uh, anarchists like Proudhon are talking the language of, of DAOs. What if we apply this kind of thinking, this sort of concepts uh, to how we, uh, how we organize uh, universities? Uh, just uh, another, uh, another person I wanna draw from is uh, the, the anthropologist, the late anthropologist, David Graeber, if you know uh, his work, uh, as I say, he works as an anthropologist, but was very uh, much involved in the Occupy movement as well. Uh, and, and we lost him, unfortunately, I think two years ago. But again, uh, in, in this book or this, uh, this conversation, uh, anarchy is described as self-organized communities that exist largely outside of any top-down coordinating authority. And again, uh, Graeber and his, uh, and his interlocutors are very clear. Uh, anarchists create rules, right? To be an anarchist is to be creating the rules with the others, with others at every moment, not just being against a system of rules. Otherwise, you're just being rebellious. And again, it's to dispel this idea that anarchy just means uh, chaos and lawlessness. Uh, it's very lawful in many ways. It's just the distinction is, is that in an anarchic system uh, or in a system of anarchy, it's the users, in a sense, that are making and enforcing laws. And again, this has all sorts of interesting, um, uh, interesting um, implications for the university. Uh, one final definition of uh, anarchy, cooperation without hierarchy or state rule. And my sense is that DAOs are a mechanism that facilitates cooperation and self-organization. Indeed, maybe DAOs are at heart anarchy and an anarchist system. I'm, uh, I've, I've long been quite uh, fascinated with uh, Burning Man. In fact, uh, for me, it's kind of a bucket list. I don't know if anybody, uh, I don't know if anybody on this uh, call is a Bennett Burning Man. That's a bucket list thing for me. Um, and uh, uh, among other things, I am very interested in the organization of Burning Man as an organization. This is just someone who's interested in, in organizations. Burning Man fascinates me, it seems uh, spontaneous, it seems unplanned, uh, it seems uh, user generated, and it most certainly is. Uh, you may or may not know that Burning Man began uh, as a bunch of people on a beach somewhere in the Bay Area. I can't remember exactly where in the Bay Area. That's where Burning Man began, uh, just a bunch of people hanging out on a beach. And it's since grown, of course, uh, to where they're now using land in the uh, Nevada desert. Um, uh, for, for Burning Man. And, and of course, you know, we're talking what 40,000 or so people that create this temporary city uh, for what, a week or two weeks or however long Burning Man is. They create a temporary city and then it's all sort of taken apart uh, again. Um, 
But what I find really fascinating is that there is a, a, an organization, there is a Burning Man organization in some ways that was required as Burning Man got larger and larger and larger. There's a terrific book by Catherine Chen called um, um, Enabling Creative Chaos. Uh, I think it's a terrific book. Uh, you might think it's a little dry, it's very sociological, but I find it fascinating because it's a description, uh, it's sort of a history of or a study of the Burning Man organization and the challenge that the organizers have to face between no organization, uh, which is what you had, you know, the early sort of Burning Man and like a Burning Man corporation where there's like, like, like total organization. Some organization at least was necessary. So uh, during one of the early Burning Man uh, events, uh, there was there was actually a uh, it was a murder it was a murder on site I think one of the uh, one of the volunteers was murdered and there was a kind of uh, you know there was a kind of lawless element uh, to 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 some of the early Burning Man's and so there was you know there was that sort of challenge you know that 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 uh, that the, so I think uh, uh, Burning Man occur, I think this is a National Park Service land I think uh, but there was some concern that you know look we're just not going to let you hold it here. Uh, because there's just there, because there's no organization here at all. By the same token, if there's too much organization, you don't really have Burning Man anymore. You've got something else, but you you sort of lost uh, what Burning Man is all about. This quote I have here is from one of the participants uh, who's sort of uh, criticizing this organization. If the original spirit of Burning Man were still alive, there wouldn't be a Burning Man organization. Instead, it would be self-organized, decentralized, a self-directed, self-forming order, rather than one imposed by some officialdom with its official rules or procedure, permanent hierarchies, and standing bureaucracies. Uh, and that is a balance that the uh, Burning Man organization has had, to, has, has had to try to achieve. You don't want standing bureaucracies. You don't want hierarchies but you do need some sort of organization. Um, other, other, otherwise, there, 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 really is going to be, there really is going to be chaos. I don't know if anyone at Burning Man is talking about uh, a DAO as a kind, of, uh, a kind of way to organize this, uh, but it strikes me that, uh, that, that what is produced, what is produced by Burning Man could certainly uh, uh, benefit from that sort of, sort of organization. And if nothing else, and I wrote about this in, in my book that I'll share here in just a bit, uh, I talk about what would it mean to organize a university the way that Burning Man is organized? Uh, I call it Burning Man University. Imagine what that sort of university would be like. Uh, maybe it's a temporary thing. Maybe, it, uh, maybe it's like a festival. Uh, it's, uh, it's there for you know, a couple of months a year and then it sort of breaks up again. Uh, maybe it travels to different, different locations. Obviously, it'd be a very, very, very different kind of organization that the university uh, represents, uh, represents today. Uh, to get back to uh, what Siegel is talking about, and again, uh, uh, to, to sort of demonstrate why anarchy, or at least an anarchic sort of organization, would be good for the university, he says that many of the good things in academic life, and this is true, I've been an academic for 30 years, this is absolutely true. The good things in academic life can, can be had only informally, spontaneously, and serendipitously. These are practically fighting words in an academy today, increasingly in the thrall to the, uh, in the, thrall to the ideology of managerialism. And the idea of a DAO, I think, is very much against uh, the opposite of, in opposition to the idea of, uh, of managerialism. So, uh, so I mentioned uh, my book, and if I'm allowed, I would like to put in a shameless plug uh, for my book, Alternative Universities, uh, where I imagine uh, uh, new different forms of a university. I sort of asked the question in the beginning, uh, if we were to start a university today, uh, what would it look like? What would you create? And I uh, suggest uh, 10 uh, models uh, for how we could organize new forms of universities. And one of those, in fact, I think it was the very first one in the, uh, in the book, uh, I call Platform University. And as you see, as I go through a description of it, uh, I think Platform University um, in, its, in its form uh, could very well be 
uh, what a Dow University might look like. And so uh, if you'll allow me this, I would like to sort of spell out uh, uh, what, this, what this could look like. So first some definitions, be clear about what we mean by a platform, what a platform is and what a platform isn't, right? And they all involve a similar, uh, similar sort of definition. So a platform is a, is a technology, a product, a service uh, that creates value by enabling direct interactions between two or more customer or participant groups. So the, the platform, uh, the purpose of the platform is to facilitate those interactions, right? So another defin here, a definition, a platform is a business that provides open participative infrastructure for, those, for interactions and sets governance conditions for them. In other words, a platform's purpose is to facilitate exchange. And again, a key feature of the platform, the third definition here, is that the activities of the platform are controlled by the users, not by owners or managers of the platform. And I think this last sentence here is particularly important. It's inevitable that participants will use the platform in ways never anticipated or planned. And that again is the, the opposite of a sort of a managerial approach, was to sort of say, here's what we're going to do and here's, you know, here's the direction we're gonna take, here's our, uh, uh, here, here are the outcomes that we want. Here's how we measure these sorts of things. Uh, platform is the exact uh, opposite of that. And again, uh, it sounds to me like we're talking very much about uh, a DAO uh, when, uh, when, we use, uh, when we use this sort of language. Um, there have been, uh, and I think we're, we're accustomed today of thinking about platforms as digital in some way. Uh, I think that at least that was the original purpose of like Airbnb and Uber and other uh, other sorts of uh, uh, other sorts of apps like that. But actually, I think that platforms have a very very long history. Uh, I think in the upper uh, left there, I've got an image uh, of the Athenian Agora, uh, the the central space in uh, classical Athens, and it was it well it was a it was a place that well there was lots of things that happened there. It was where uh, debates took place. It's, it was a market. It's where trade occurred. It's where, you know, pickpockets would, uh, uh, you know, would try to steal money. It's where other sorts of things like happen to happen. In other words, the Agora wasn't built with to say, this is going to be used for such and such a purpose. The Agora was a space that, well, its purposes were determined by the people who used it. Um, and that is, again, I think a very definition of what a DAO can be. Uh, a bazaar, I think, is a kind of platform, or indeed, uh, you know, it's, it sounds like a pretty simplistic example, but a shopping mall is a kind of, is a kind of mall. We've got a, uh, here in Columbus, and I'm sure in, in other cities there's something similar, we have, uh, we have downtown something called the North Market, and the North Market is, the, the purpose of the North Market is to provide stalls or spaces for, uh, for purveyors to connect with customers. That's its, that's its purpose, that's its function. Uh, and so again, uh, that's like a shopping mall, that's like a bazaar. Co-working spaces, I think, are a kind of platform. Uh, again, the co-working space isn't saying, here's the kind of work that's going to be performed here. That's determined by, well, the people who use or participate in it. Uh, an artist collective is the same, uh, same sort of structure, Wikipedia. If we're going to talk about digital examples, Wikipedia is maybe the most famous uh, example uh, of, a, of a platform. But uh, all of these are a particular kind of organization. And I ask in my book, what would it mean to organize a university as a platform, as opposed to a sort of a corporate or managerial university? I imagine in the book, um, I imagine uh, that uh, platform university would uh, be organized or could be organized something like an unconference. And before we started this, I was uh, sort of quizzing a couple of people if they knew what, a, what an unconference was. I know that uh, Melinda said she had participated in one. Uh, for the, and it probably been about a decade since I'd been in one. But if, if you've never been to an unconference, uh, it's a conference where all the participants arrive and, the, and there is no agenda, at least there's no agenda before you, before you arrive. The very first move in the conference is to set the agenda. And so there's usually some sort of board like, uh, like it is here, uh, times are agreed upon, and then people can just walk up and propose uh, some sort of presentation. 
And they can sort of fill in, you know, a time right there and say, here's my presentation. And then the rest of the participants go around and, you know, put a sticky note or something like that, a check on it to say, boy, I'd be interested in this, or I'd be interested in this. And then what emerges is not just simply uh, the, uh, the list of the presentations, but then if you find that, that you know, this, uh, this uh, topic here, uh, you know, everybody wants to attend that, and maybe nobody wants to attend this one over here, well, then that gets dropped. We're just not going to have that presentation. So the conference sort of emerges from these interactions of the participants that arrive. Uh, meetup, I think, is uh, probably another way to organize something like that. But an unconference strikes me as a way that a platform university could work. I'm imagining something like uh, a teacher, uh, someone with knowledge to share, says, I would like to do a course on this. I would like to teach you on, I don't know, blockchain, take whatever case this is. And then if you have enough students that say, oh yeah, that looks really interesting, I'm gonna go for that. Then they agree to, uh, they agree to that class. If someone else proposes, and I'm not gonna say, I'm not gonna say what it is, someone else proposes another idea for class and no students are, uh, have any interest in that, then the course isn't taught. It just simply doesn't happen. It also works uh, in reverse. Students could say, boy, you know what? We would really, a bunch of us here would really like a course on blockchain. And then a professor or a teacher could say, yeah, okay, I could, I could do something like that. So in other words, the unconference format or by extension here, the extending the analogy, the platform university is that space that facilitates that exchange between professors that have something to teach and students that have an interest in learning something. And it's about finding and fitting the two of those together and creating courses that way. And I wanna emphasize that it, uh, 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 it's not just simply students that are driving this, it's teachers that could drive this. And that's gonna have implications uh, as we'll see here in just a moment for who counts as a professor. In such a system, if we think about the university as a platform facilitating this sort of exchange, what that means is that the curriculum is an emergent property. And I know later today, I think there's, or maybe tomorrow, there's going to be a session on emergence, think in emergence in the sciences, but just sort of very, very, uh, very simply and quickly, and I don't want to, I don't want to misstate, um, uh, emergence means uh, when a system exhibits behaviors uh, that are not just simply the adding up of the individual parts of the system. It's a behavior that emerges from the interaction uh, of, uh, of the parts within a system. And Platform University would have a curriculum that is emergent. In other words, you don't start the university by saying, we are going to teach this class and this class and this class, and we're gonna have a school of engineering and we're gonna have a, a department of psychology. Uh, if that's what teachers are interested in teaching, and students are interested in learning about, then that's the curriculum that emerges. And that curriculum is not set in stone. In other words, uh, over time, uh, maybe students are less interested in psychology and they're more interested in, I don't know, in game design or something like that. And so a new sort of curriculum emerges. Um, this is unplanned. This whole process is unplanned. It's not an administrator saying, well, you know what, I think what we need uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, is, is some sort of engineering school or something like that. Uh, a platform university would be one where it really, <laughs> it really would be a very, very uh, market sensitive institution. Uh, but you'd have to sort of start from the premise that the curriculum is going to be an emergent phenomenon. And that means it's not something that is easily planned uh, or indeed managed. Uh, by, uh, by administrators. It should also be uh, pretty clear that uh, Platform University, as I'm imagining it, would be permeable, meaning uh, open to uh, exchange with uh, the world outside of the university. That's part of what permeable means. We think of like a membrane as permeable if it allows water to, uh, uh, to, to, to flow through it easily enough. Uh, I'm imagining uh, instead the, um, the opposite of sort of the ivory tower as it is today. We put up all sorts of walls. Sometimes we put up, you know, sort of physical walls. We're gonna separate ourselves uh, from, from our surroundings. But it's also in the way in which we, uh, we put up uh, uh, firewalls, for instance. Uh, who's a student 
is uh, is determined by you know like by entrance criteria. You know, have you paid money? Those sorts of things. Uh, same is true for professors. Professor is determined by uh, uh, by by sort of a central authority. Uh, a university as a platform would be much much more open to this. So, for instance, I guess any prof anybody could claim to be a professor and to say. I'm going to offer such and such a class. Uh, and whether or not that class actually happens, I guess, is a function of whether uh, students uh, actually sign up for it. Uh, does this person know what they're doing? Do they have any sort of reputation in this? If, uh, I don't know, if I were to say, I'm going to offer a course in uh, quantum mechanics, uh, I actually have no standing. I have no qualification to teach sort of a class like that. And maybe I, maybe I offer it, but students find very quickly, yeah, this sucks. Yeah, this is no good. Uh, and so that class or that, uh, that person is, uh, uh, is uh, by fiat sort of kicked out of the system because they, they just have no following. Uh, this is going to be very troubling, I think, for uh, this concept, I think, is very troubling for sort of uh, purists about the university. Wait a minute, anybody, just anybody can come in and sort of talk about anything? Uh, if you're going to have a truly platform university, you have to be sort of open to that possibility. Uh, but as I say, I think that there are sort of market mechanisms in place that would uh, almost almost like the edit function in Wikipedia, that uh, that 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 poor teachers or people who are uh, uh, without sort of qualification uh, don't find their way there. It's also possible that as we talk about the organization of something like a platform university, maybe there are guidelines and standards that have to be met. Maybe that's something that the platform does. Maybe they put in place some sort of rule or procedure or protocol about who can, who can teach. Maybe that's a kind of a light administration that maybe our anarchist friends uh, wouldn't uh, necessarily approve of. That's something we would have to think about. What would be what would be the kinds of? I mean, permeable doesn't mean absence. Permeable still implies at least some sort of boundary. Uh, maybe a platform university uh, enforces or uh, maintains those kinds of community standards for who can be who can actually be a professor. The um, a platform university would also be protean. Uh, which is just a fancy word uh, for ever changing or capable of changing rapidly. Uh, that's a, a, a structure that, that's protein. Uh, and indeed, that is uh, in many ways the exact opposite of a university, which is uh, very, very slow to change for a number of reasons. Um, and and we, needn't, we needn't go into those. Uh, universities can actually be very, very conservative organizations, even if the professors within them might uh, be progressive and liberal. The uh, organization itself can be very, very, very uh, 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 conservative. And as Melinda says, very slow to do anything. Uh, platform university would be a protein and, uh, and ever changing. And uh, some of that has to do with, again, the emergent, uh, the emergent behaviors that it would uh, facilitate. As I say, the curriculum itself would be a uh, flowing and changing. It wouldn't be sort of set in stone. There would be there would be regulars. There'd be regular faculty that would form, as uh, uh, Michael Malone talks about in his book, that would form a core to the organization. And these would be particularly well known or popular uh, 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 professors. The sort of uh, the sort of person that students uh, would uh, go back to and uh, uh, again and again and again. But then you'd also have a sort of a, uh, what, what Malone calls a cloud of people uh, uh, who would uh, maybe come into the platform university, teach the occasional class and then leave. I might be the CEO of a company, let's say. Uh, and I'll come in, and I'll, I'll teach a class. I'll teach one class this year. Uh, and it's very popular, but you know, I'm, I'm gonna go back and, and, and work in this business. And so you'd have a combination of, of, of people that have more of, a, of, of, a, of more longevity, I guess, within the organization, and then others who sort of come and go at semi-regular intervals. But what that means is that at any given time, the, the makeup of the university uh, is ever-changing. Again, it's a function of the people, it's a function of the, of the kinds of things being taught there as well. 
this provides its own sort of organizational sort of challenge uh, for, uh, for a platform university. But again, it strikes me that a DAO is precisely a mechanism that facilitates or allows a, a, a very protean uh, structure uh, to, uh, to the organization uh, that is the university. I've been, um, um, I, I guess, a little um, uh, coy about the nature of uh, leadership or the nature of the organization. Uh, what would Dow University, uh, if, if it were organized as a platform, what, what would it mean in terms of, would there be a president, for instance? Would you have administrators at all? I just spent the first part of this talk railing against too many administrators, too much organization. Uh, but as I say in the, in the Burning Man example, um, that's not to say that there would be no organization, or at the very least, you run into challenges uh, if there's zero organization. And so what would it mean for there to be some organization balancing between none and too much? What does that balance look like? And I'm particularly interested in what leadership would look like. And what I've often said is uh, uh, that for organizations like a platform, organizations like a DAO, the sort of leadership you have is not command and control, but cultivation and care. It means the leader is something like a gardener, right? The sort of person that uh, allows uh, things to grow uh, and, and helps with that process. It strikes me that leadership of a platform is that which facilitates the kinds of exchanges that are the very purpose of the platform that the purpose of leadership is to ensure those exchanges and those exchanges are healthy and, uh, uh, and vibrant and are often and, and are leading the, uh, the organization to thrive. But it's different than from saying, here's what we're gonna do, right? Here's what you're going to do. Now that you're here in this organization, let me tell you what classes you're going to take. If you're gonna get a degree from here, you need to be able to have X, Y, and Z. Um, it's a very, very different sort of leadership style, cultivation and care. And again, think of the analogy, think of the metaphor of a gardener uh, when you want to do that. Um, there was Dr. an organization- Dr. Staley, yes. sorry to interrupt. That's okay. Um, I just want to let you know, we have 15 more minutes. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm nearly, nearly finished. Um, and I uh, wanted to leave lots of time for comments and uh, complaints and those sorts of things. No. Um, <clears throat> this, is, uh, this is an organization I started in Columbus about a decade or so ago. Uh, it was after uh, my TEDx talk in uh, 2010, but uh, it was called Universitas. And in some ways it was a, it was a platform university. Um, it, was, uh, it was a physical space. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a virtual space. It was a physical space that brought together uh, people from different uh, backgrounds, different uh, disciplines and we mash them up together. Uh, what would happen if uh, a, uh, an artist and a, a tech CEO uh, interacted within the space that was Universitas? Uh, and what we got were some really interesting results. Uh, I connected, a, uh, I connected the, uh, the, the creator of Columbus's makerspace uh, with, um, with uh, the Columbus Museum of Art. And there was a, an exhibit that came out of that between uh, 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 working on a lathe and uh, you know, producing an art exhibition. And these are the sorts of interactions that Universitas uh, enabled. But we didn't go into Universitas saying, here are the things that we're going to do. Here are the outcomes that we want. We simply provided a forum that brought people together and whatever resulted uh, was we knew was going to be amazing and combustible. Of course, what we also knew is that uh, sometimes an interaction could produce nothing more maybe than some pleasant conversation over coffee uh, and nothing would result. In other words, it was unplanned, the results. And that makes it very difficult to manage. That makes it very difficult to, uh, uh, to talk about outcomes. Uh, and in fact, the, uh, and since I'm talking here about leadership, the title that uh, I gave myself uh, was not president or CEO or commander, uh, but catalyst, chief catalyst, in the same way that uh, a catalyst uh, is uh, something that facilitates uh, an, uh, a, a, um, an action. 
Uh, it's usually used in chemistry to describe that, right? A, a catalyst is an agent that produces some sort of effect. Uh, that was the sort of leadership that I wanted to provide, not again, command and control. And it strikes me that in a Tao university, you would have administrators and leaders, but playing a very different role than the kind of leadership that we see of universities today, more catalytic uh, than, than maybe what we're accustomed to. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure everyone on this call is familiar with the term protocol, at least as it refers to computing, rules and procedures for transmitting data between computers, let's say. But I'm really struck by this book uh, by Alexander Galloway on protocol. And what he does is he looks back to the older connotations of the word protocol. Prior to how we use it today in computing, protocol referred to any type of correct or proper behavior within a, within a specific system of conventions. You would sometimes hear in diplomacy, someone who was the protocol officer, the one who was in charge in you know, what we're gonna be, you know, who, do you bow, who bows to whom, who's sitting next to whom. Um, but in Galloway's sense, a protocol is a technique for achieving voluntary regulation within a contingent environment. And it strikes me that protocols might be a way that we think about what self-organization looks like in something like a DAO. And if we're talking about the role of leadership, the role of leadership then is to maintain those protocols. I always think uh, anytime I talk about uh, these issues, uh, I always think it's a good idea to cite uh, Paul Goodman, uh, who would probably, define, probably define himself as an anarchist. Uh, he wrote uh, The Community of Scholars in 1962, and it's, uh, it, it's been a really important and influential book for how I think about a lot of these issues. And he, um, uh, he says, it's impossible to consider our universities in America without being powerfully persuaded by the principle of anarchy, the free association and federation rather than top-down management and administration. He was arguing for this in the 1960s. He reminds us that the first universities, the first medieval universities were in his words, the spontaneous product of that instinct of association, which swept, swept over the towns of Europe in the course of the 11th and 12th centuries. Part of what he meant like, by that is that universities were places that connected teachers and students. I cited this in my chapter on platform university to say, in some ways, the first universities were themselves platform universities. If a teacher wants to teach something, he must think it worthwhile. And students want either to learn something particular or to find out what it is they want to learn. That condition is enough for a school. And it strikes me that that condition is enough for a Dow University. So let's do it. My call to action is let's do it. Let's create City Dow University. Thanks yes, very much. Yes, let's do Thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. So happy to have you here and to, okay, so let's get to the questions. So one of the first questions was how to address the issue of accreditation if things are sort of unplanned and freeform. So I know that is uh, one of the um, one of the one of the criteria, one of the things that uh, City Dow University wants to do. Uh, and uh, so I have some thoughts on this. If you want to hear the thoughts. <laughs> Um, so the first is, I think uh, it, uh, um, it would be uh, a real challenge, if not an impossibility, to get accredited, at least, at least in the way that the current regional accrediting system is put together. It would be a real challenge because, and I'm going to throw a credit, I know this is being recorded and I'm going to throw accreditors under the bus here. Creditors aren't, uh, aren't known for their innovation. They aren't known for that. And in fact, there's uh, all sorts of examples of how accreditors uh, snuff out innovation. Uh, I, won't, I won't bore you with all sorts of instances of this. Um, uh, and so I think that there would, be, there would be a real challenge right up front, real challenges if what you were looking for was, uh, was a sort of a traditional regional accreditor. 
So there's sort of two ways that one could think about this. So uh, I uh, I started a conversation with um, and 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 I'm speaking for me. I am not speaking for the uh, Carnegie Foundation for teaching. I am not speaking for them. And I said, what we need then is a uh, new accreditor who would focus specifically on innovative universities. So that accreditation, you would get accreditation not from one of the five regional accreditors, but to an accreditor who was uh, particularly in tune to new innovative forms of the university. So that's what we do. And maybe what that means is that we have to invent it. We have to create it. I don't know. Yeah, uh, maybe that's a solution. I but there's another solution as well, and that is uh, forget accreditation. What is it that accreditation means? Well, for most institutions, you want to be accredited so you can get federal funds, right? So that you can have student, uh, uh, federal student uh, aid and those sorts of things. That is, in many cases, that's the number one criteria. But by the same token, maybe you don't actually need accreditation, especially if we're going to talk about a different funding model. And we haven't we haven't talked about how Dow University, Dow University is, uh, is funded. We can have that conversation. But maybe the accreditation comes from its success. If lots and lots of students are signing up for classes, and in fact, those students have really good outcomes, then by reputation itself, the City Dow University has an accreditation that way. Not because the Higher Learning Commission or someplace like that gave it accreditation, but its success, its very success in the marketplace uh, is its accreditation. So I don't know if that's the, like I said, I have thoughts about this. I don't know if that's the answer that you were looking for, but accreditation would be one of the, one of the, one of the significant challenges. Yeah, that's, those, I think it's something we're gonna use as food for thought. Okay, so can we call platform university an ad hocracy. Would ad hocracy, could we use ad hocracy as the label for it? So, uh, potentially, uh, how are we defining ad hocracy? I'd have to ask M. Danahy. Are you there, M. Danahy? Yeah, basically, it sounds like uh, the same thing you're talking about. Uh, I do a lot of reading with uh, towns and cities and governments, uh, particularly led by Audrey Tang, the digital minister from Taiwan. And she's developed some software that collects a lot of people's input. And they're just at the initial stages of experimenting with it. But uh, it seems to have. Um, a lot of positive benefits and she's getting a lot of visibility and some other countries, I believe Spain and Iceland have taken her software and developed it a little bit more and basically doing the same thing. But uh, uh, yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. Well, no, 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 I, I apologize. If, if, by ad hoc, if by ad hoc we mean improvisational, then uh, I think the answer to this is absolutely yes. Uh, and in fact, part of what we're talking about here is an organization that's, uh, that, that looks more like uh, an improv uh, group uh, than say a traditional university. And improvisation of course is uh, unplanned, spontaneous, um, uh, also depends a great deal on uh, listening. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Also K-12 education is into this sort of thing too, with what they call school improvement process, where they are getting input from students, parents, teachers, uh, and driving changes in uh, the way they deliver curriculum based on that type of data. And uh, to me, that seems like an adhocracy too. And it's definitely a bottom-up design. It's not top-down. This is the way you shall teach. This is what you should teach. It's uh, based on the input from the parents, from the students, uh, as well as the teachers. Mm -hmm. Splendid. Yeah. Okay, let's see what we have next. We've got, um, so, um, 
somebody made a comment um, about dispute resolution might might be a need that would arise. Um, so I guess the question in that is, with this sort of decentralized, unplanned, sort of maybe structured chaos, chaos, but there's some you know structure there. Do you think that um, there's some key structures like dispute resolution that would need to be permanent in it? Uh, to be sure, the question is how um, how are um, um, how uh, how is uh, how are those formed? I guess is the answer is the question I'm asking, which is to say, uh, uh, does do, do the do the rules or protocols come from uh, from the top? Or are they something that is determined by community values? Mm. So it's uh, I, and I think Wikipedia here is a is a, is a case in point. To think about how disputes ha are handled there, there is an organization uh, to Wikipedia, but those administrators sort of bubble up from the users, and the community sets the uh, standards uh, standards for practice and behavior. And so I suppose that is the is the key sort of difference here. Who's enforcing it? How is it enforced? Yep, community values and mission maybe, rather than top down. Uh, yeah, top down enforcement for dispute resolution definitely seems biased toward the administration. Um, let's see. So we only have a couple more minutes. Let me see if I can find a quick question. Um, I guess this one is sort of like about quality control. Here's a comment. Somebody has to wrangle the students and have that awkward conversation with the bad teachers. Um, comments on comment on like quality control, sort of that sort of leadership that might arise in a decentralized university. Um, it's a good question, and uh, it puts me immediately in mind to uh, the medieval foundations of the University of Bologna. Uh, those that sort of know the, the, the history of, of medieval universities, there were sort of two, uh, 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 two prototypes, I guess, or two standards. University of Paris, which was sort of professor-driven, and Bologna, which was student-driven. And what that meant is that the students decide, uh, here are the professors that we want, and we will pay you. Uh, and if we don't like you, uh, we used to stop paying you. Uh, it really was a student-driven uh, student university. And when I present this uh, to my students, uh, I, I, th their eyes become uh, ravenous at the idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so I suspect it's, um, it, it, I suspect my first thought is that it would look something like that. What that implies though, I think, is a particular kind of student. Right, a particular student that says, you know, here's uh, that that sort of knows what they want, uh, yeah. has certain expectations of what that means. Um, uh, certainly, not every student is uh, is 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 going to is is going to feel that way. I think that to be a student at uh, at Platform or City Dow University uh, means that you already have a certain kind of orientation uh, toward uh, toward your education. Uh, and uh, and and toward the toward the nature of authority. Right on, and I think it's also like uh, if you made the effort to be there, there's sort of this intrinsic motivation and engagement, self self you know self determined uh, engagement that's that makes all the world a difference. Well, uh, we've only got. Yeah, four more minutes till the next session starts. So I'm afraid we got to wrap it up here. Any parting words, David Warner? Like anything we need to do to wrap up? No, I think it's I think it's great. Thank you so much, Dr. Staley. It's been enlightening. It's been a, a pleasure and an honor to hear your your thoughts on this. Um, I love the fact that there are all kinds of elements of academia that obviously this is a, a, something you've thought about for a long time. Looking at some of the comments that have been going on. A lot of a lot of people have been interested in this. Uh, Rob mentioned he wrote his dissertation on this essentially, which is fantastic. That's very exciting. Um, there is some talk. I'd, I wish we had more time. Of course, people were discussing Khan Academy and whether or not that represents a platform university. And I think that's a really interesting question too, in terms of the 
synchronicity versus asynchronicity, which technologically just wasn't possible in the past. And can we categorize those kind of institutions as platform universities? Um, maybe we can take a minute and talk about that. But just before we do, our first panel will begin in three minutes is the plan. Our first panel, just so everybody knows, will be on the Web3 College Town. And that is the idea of how do we have student life? If we have a somewhat Zoom-based or certainly asynchronous university, where is that vibrant experience of meeting people in dormitories and exploring buildings and all of that in that panel will have uh, people from Inverted Forest, Crypto Culture and Society, students from the University of California at Irvine, and from the Digital Currency Initiative at MIT. So that's a very exciting panel. In just a minute after that, we will meet in Gathertown for a discussion at one o'clock, and then we'll come back this afternoon at two o'clock in the same Zoom channel for a discussion of decentralized science, where we have people from DSI Labs, Smart Contract Research Forum, 3852.ai, Motive Metrics. And then at three o'clock, we have a discussion very much about what Dr. Staley mentioned, which is how do you fund Web3 education? And we're very pleased to have people from Gitcoin, which are absolute leaders in the Web3 funding space. The, that will be the host, uh, Maxwell from Gitcoin. We also have people from Odyssey and from CityDAO, and then that will close out today. So if you wanted to take a minute, I, I would love to hear your thoughts on Khan Academy before we jump into panel one. Um, in its, uh, uh, and I want to be uh, quick about this, I guess. Uh, yes, sort of a pla yeah, sort of a platform. The distinction being there's only one uh, provider. Salcon is is sort of the only provider. But as a model for the sort of thing that we're talking about, uh, yeah, I think that that uh, could form the basis of, uh, of of what a platform university can look like. But again, I want to emphasize uh, it's it's about connecting teachers, plural, and students, plural. That'd be the only sort of distinction I would draw. Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, everybody. You're welcome to stay. I'm going to pause the recording just so I have a separation, and then we'll start it again in just two minutes. If anybody wants to go get a cup of coffee or do whatever, uh, thank you very much, and we'll see everybody at the first panel.